Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we have a story where somebody steals a sample of cesium-137. This story is one my dad told me he'd like me to share. He was an instructor in a freshman physics lab in university. The lab was to teach the students how to use the equipment to measure the decay rate for radioactive samples. In this case, they were using cesium-137 samples packed in a metal cylinder that shielded the beta radiation with only a small hole that allows for some beta radiation to escape so that it can be measured without irradiating everything around it. See below. One of these students decided to sneak one of these samples out to show his friends. So this idiot took one of the samples, put it in his pocket, pretended to leave to use the bathroom, and never came back. When the lab was over, there was a panic when one of the samples was missing. They eventually connected the dots and figured that the guy stole it. After a manhunt, they found him and the sample in his pocket about four inches away from his fullerenes a part you really don't want to expose to ionizing radiation. The cesium-137 sample was recovered, and the thief was given a health check, then got into big trouble. The event was recorded as an official radioactive contaminant incident. Though he passed the health check, to this day, my dad still wonders if this guy has developed health complications due to his actions during that day. You know, it's definitely not a good idea to put a radioactive source that close to your fullerenes, I hope that the guy didn't suffer any long-term health consequences. It's definitely not a good idea to hide radioactive samples next to your body. This is an image of what the sample looked like. It's just a metal cylinder containing the source inside. This is today's Yikes Awardee. My chem teacher's story. When she was in high school, this is in London, she was in a poorer one. And they were doing some experiment slash practical lesson with bromine. We did one too. I believe it was a simple, throw in some magnesium hydroxide and observe the reaction. And some dude decided it would be funny to inhale the bright brown bromine gas, and he got rushed to the hospital and had severe lung issues since. Asthma-esque. Since he just snorted bromine gas, apparently, after a while, he either got cancer or some lung disease probably due to it. Another story was one kid using a burette as a javelin and obviously shattering it and then getting suspended, I believe. You definitely shouldn't be fooling around with bromine vapor. That's not something you want to breathe in. And when you give in to that temptation, this is what happens. Now, sometimes chemistry can get you into some pretty hairy situations, but today's sponsor will help get you out of hairy situations. This video is sponsored by Manscaped. You may know that Manscaped has all sorts of products to keep your fullerenes free of pesky substituents, but did you know that Manscaped is now going beyond the buckyballs with their brand new beard hedger trimmer for your face? Beard hairs may be good for recrystallizations, but are you tired of being called a neck beard by your coworkers? Then this beard hedger by Manscaped might be perfect for you. With a powerful 7200 RPM motor, this beard trimmer is ready to tackle even the thickest of beards. The trimmer features a 41mm titanium coated T-blade for a comfortable trim. Check out the new Beard Hedger Pro Kit, a complete beard maintenance kit for the modern man. The Pro Kit includes the Beard Hedger, Beard Shampoo, Beard Conditioner, Beard Oil, Beard Balm, a travel bag, as well as a free gift. If you're looking to step up your grooming routine, go to manscaped.com today and get 20% off plus free international shipping when you use the promo code VATCHEMIST at checkout. Make sure you use the code VATCHEMIST so that Manscaped will know you came from here. I want to thank Manscaped for their support of this channel. Okay, story time for me. During my first year as a chemical engineering student, we had to do a Canizaro reaction with benzaldehyde. Once the reaction was done, we had to distill everything to separate our benzoic acid and or benzyl alcohol. A Canizaro reaction is a disproportionation reaction where an aldehyde is converted into one equivalent of the corresponding carboxylic acid and one equivalent of the corresponding alcohol. This is what the Canizaro reaction for benzaldehyde looks like. It was a cold day, and our products would only boil around 200 degrees Celsius, but to achieve that temperature, our dry sin had to be around 250 to 300 degrees Celsius. In a loud pop, one of the alcohol thermometers in the dry sin exploded violently, shooting glass shards all around. Luckily, no one was injured, and alcohol vapor in the room. We were lucky to have not used the old mercury thermometers. The scent of alcohol was still in the air for a good time. Close to the end, a cold drop of benzoic acid that had condensed on the side of the glass before the refrigerant rolled down the side of my flask, making it explode too. Almost pure benzoic acid in the flask ended up on a 350 degrees Celsius dry sin, evaporating instantly and filling the whole room with acid fumes. Of course, they only had fume arms and not fume hoods. I believe a fume arm in this instance is one that just wafts away the smell. Between the alcohol and the acid, we were both tipsy and crying after that day. This is a really unfortunate story. I'm not too sure what the students could have done here to avoid this from going wrong. The only thing I could guess is maybe they were heating a closed system, in which case, make sure you always have an open system and make sure you're not heating something in a closed system. I was a lab helper for about a year, and one of my jobs was making sure all of our solvent waste was LSC tested for radioactivity. 
Well, someone at work tried to play Tetris and did a really bad job of it. It didn't look like anything was wrong from the angle I was standing at, so I moved the front of the 10-liter jerry can, when lo and behold, a bottle of 10-liter radioactive waste goes flying, hits the floor, and the lid busts off, spilling all over my legs and shoes and the floor. Thank the gods my co-workers heard me scream, Someone get the spill granules now! And they came running in with them, containing the spill from going under our benches. I don't think I've ever run away so fast in my life, and I just threw my lab coats, boots, socks, and trousers off and showered myself off. We keep extra trousers at work, just in case we ever have visitors who happen to not have trousers on. I had to wear these massive chef trousers and go chat with my manager about what happened. Luckily, it was solvent waste and not the HPLC waste, because the radioactivity was minuscule and not even enough to have to throw my clothes away. Let's just say I got very, very lucky that I didn't start glowing in the dark. Anyway, lab coat and jeans and boots saved me, along with my quick sprinting skills. I've never run so fast. I'm glad to hear you dodged a bullet on this one. If you act quick enough and you get to the shower fast enough, you can minimize a lot of the damage that would occur. Yo, Iranian guy here. I remember this when I was passing by my school the other day. Our school was shoddy and poorly built, with a total lack of funds for the experiment and science department. The lab we had consisted of a single 2.5 by 4 meter room with a single lab table in the middle that had a burner, a basin sink, and a bunch of cupboards and drawers. There was no fume hood or even a fan to vent any gas buildup. The only way that any air would be vented was through a moldy wooden window that led to the woodworking workshop in the back. During my three years in that school, there were countless times that students had to leave the room because they inhaled irritants or gases that were either cytotoxic or oxidizers. Our chem teacher even did a large number of flame tests with metals, hydrogen peroxide reactions, and even stuff with hydrochloric acid and I think chlorine at one point. And this one time, we were doing a burn reaction for something, I can't recall exactly what, since it was ages ago, which didn't allow students to bring in food with them. But since this was after P.E., some dumb kids thought it would be a good idea to bring cookies with them. In the end, I think the vapors either corroded their food or caused a toxic reaction. There was a lot of coughing and a lot of drinking water. Did I mention that at no point did the class or anyone wear PPE, even while working with HCL, not even the chem teacher? This is a very sus thing, and I hope that if you're ever in any position where you can make a difference, that you do make a difference. Encouraging people to do things a little bit safer goes a long way, and it can definitely save lives or can improve the remainder of people's lives. Not having a permanent scar? How much is that worth? It's worth installing a fume hood, and it's always worth wearing PPE. Not my story, but I had a friend who worked at a hospital. They were going to do a PET scan, which stands for Positron Emission Tomography. They literally generate positrons, which are antimatter, and they annihilate the matter in your body. That generates two gamma rays, and they can figure out where in your body the gamma rays came from. So PET imaging is pretty cool. It uses antimatter. Some pretty futuristic stuff. And so they needed to make fluorine 18. Fluorine 18 is a positron emitter. And if you have a fluorine 18 labeled drug, the radio label can be used to visualize parts of your body. The guy that was working on the cyclotron took the small vial containing the fluorine 18, dropped and broke it, causing the radioactive fluorine to get on the floor. Everyone ran out of the room. Needless to say, the patient didn't get the scan that day. There are a lot of engineering controls in place for people working with fluorine 18, along with other radioisotopes, but things can still go wrong. I figure, after watching for quite a bit, I might as well share my relevant story. Not nearly as bad as most stories, but I hope it's still entertaining enough to be featured. This didn't happen to my class, but a previous one, and was at least while I was still in high school, an often shared tale. The chemistry teacher was doing an experiment to demonstrate how the temperature can change where the equilibrium of a reaction lies. This was done with a bath of hot water, a bath of ice water, and a decently sized vial of nitrogen dioxide. Before the experiment, the teacher said what amounts to, this chemical is very toxic. If the vial breaks, we have to evacuate the school. The experiment goes as usual, until after putting the vial into the hot water. He attempts to take it out with his hands. He burns himself, and as a reflex, throws the vial. It lands, depending on who you ask, on the desk of the first or second row of students and shatters. He simply opened the windows and continued with a new vial. A couple years later, we had him in our country's equivalent of AP chemistry class, and luckily with us, the experiment went without a hitch, although we still got many memorable quotes from him, such as when we were doing a series of experiments to determine what substance we had. This is what he said. As many of you have figured out, this is sugar. Back in my day, a common test was a taste test, which would have revealed that rather quickly, but then again, chemists didn't get to 50. I think tasting your chemicals is a surefire way to make sure you won't make it to 50. Do not taste your chemicals, please. 
The only chemicals you should be tasting are food grade ones that are safe for you to eat. Always wear goggles, guys. I got some spaghetti sauce in my eye and it hurts like hell. <laughs> Thanks for watching and I hope you have a great day.